I have a question for you. When the cops say, there's nothing to see here, do you think there's usually something to see there? Does that, I mean, do you believe them? Come on, honestly. Well, in this case out here in California and Sacramento and the CHP won't release just a few extra seconds so that we could determine if what we think happened really happened. They won't do it because what we think happened is we think that the cops shot the hostage and we're like, oopsie. The California Police Department is refusing to release body cam video and its legal argument could actually roll back law enforcement transparency across the state. As California investigative correspondent Julie Watts explains, CBS is suing not just to get the video, but to prevent an agency from effectively rewriting state law. Yeah, we've been working with law enforcement for nearly a year to try to avoid this lawsuit. But one local agency is simply refusing to release its full video, which the public has a right to see. And if we don't push back, their interpretation of the law could have a ripple effect across the state. But my favorite part is the binoculars. These days, now they look closer. Seven-year-old Sawyer is always on the lookout. And I keep thinking about bad guys. And he has good reason. It was really scary. Sawyer's mom, Kelsey, decided to take the kids to this popular park last April during spring break. There were kids all over, kids at camp and kids without parents. Little did they know, a Highway Patrol special task force had already made what turned out to be a fatal decision to serve a planned high-risk search warrant to an armed felon at a public park without clearing the park or notifying local police. I just really don't understand why they, they chose this park that day. Multiple shots fired, suspect, white male. For days, CHP had been surveilling a felon with a history of running from police. But instead of serving the warrant at his home, they chose to wait until he took his dogs to a busy park. And then we see cops chasing after a criminal. Court records allege when officers confronted suspect Eric Abril, he began shooting at them. The officer confirmed gunshot wound to the chest and hand. CHP fired back as Abril ran toward the batting cages. That's when we got on the ground. Where kids were playing. And then gunshots were fired. Roughly 20. Bullet holes near the batting cages revealed just how close the children were to being shot in the crossfire. It was terrifying. Jim McKeegan and his high school sweetheart Patty were out for a walk. They just celebrated their 50th anniversary. It would be their last. He's going to shoot the hostage. As local police swarmed the park, yeah, Jim was killed and Abril used Patty as a human shield. I was thinking it would shoot me. Park staff quickly rushed kids into the library where they had to hide under tables to avoid the windows. He was too scared to go to sleep. He would double check all the locks. Nearly a year later, the community is still desperate for answers and accountability. I would ask CHP if they would make the same decision if their kids were playing at the park. Keep in mind, CHP is the governor's police force with jurisdiction across the state. It could happen to anyone's family at any park. But CHP won't answer questions or acknowledge any policy changes when serving high-risk warrants. It feels like they're trying to cover it up. So we've been searching for answers through public records, including video from that day. Guys, get down. Which appears to begin after Mr. McKeegan was killed. Suspect is in custody. The Sheriff's Department hasn't released his coroner's report, but multiple sources tell CBS News it's inconclusive about where the fatal shot came from, meaning it's not clear who fired it. Whoever's in the field, you're in our backdrop. Roseville PD, which took over the investigation, says it's confident the suspect fatally shot the victim, but refuses to release its full body camera video, released just four 39 second edited clips. 123 crossfire, I was going to fire the shot. Which appear to show officers shooting at each other amid the chaos, but provide little transparency or context for what went wrong that day the risk to the children, the McKeegans, and to officers. Stop the gun! State law requires agencies release any recording that relates to a law enforcement shooting or critical incident. For instance, remember when 14-year-old Valentina was killed trying on quinceanera dresses in a Southern California dressing room? A stray bullet pierced the dressing room wall, killing Valentina, who died in her mother's arms while hiding and praying. Per LAPD policy, based on state law, they had to release the video of the actions and events leading up to and including the critical incident. San Francisco PD has a similar policy and hosts its videos on the city's YouTube channel. But Roseville PD is now attempting to rewrite state law. Instead of releasing recordings that depict an incident involving the discharge of a firearm, they claim they only have to release the video of the discharge of the firearm. The video is 
public property. San Francisco Assemblymember Phil Ting wrote the law that Roseville's trying to change. He worries Roseville's interpretation could prompt other agencies to start withholding video, stressing the public pays for the police cameras and the servers they store that video on, so the video belongs to the public. They're arguing that under your legislation, they're only required to release the 39 seconds when the bullets actually left the gun. When you drafted this legislation, did you intend to define the critical incident as only the moments of the discharge of the firearm? Uh, absolutely not, because if that was the case, that would have been written into law. In order to provide transparency, you need to know what's happening leading up to the confrontation. And in California, if a public agency refuses to release a public record, your only option is to sue. I imagine it'll be a court uh, decision on this. Law enforcement consultant John McGinnis supports police transparency, but the former Sacramento County Sheriff also supports Roseville PD in this case. Roseville PD is saying, we're not going to abide by the law. We're going to make you sue us to get this video, and taxpayers are going to have to foot the bill. Is that fair? And I don't know why they're withholding it, but if they have, if they believe they're on solid ground, if they're doing the right thing, I say stand on principle and let another branch of government make that decision. We've now filed our body camera lawsuit. Vanda Brill is awaiting his trial. Escape from the hospital. Now facing additional charges for escaping about a month after the shootout. And in a twist of fate, they found it at grandma's house. He was found hiding in the creek just feet from Sawyer's grandma's front door. I know 911. Sawyer's learned a lot over the past year. But I don't have a phone. Maybe more than any seven year old should have to. But I do have a plan. Kelsey's hoping the full body camera video I will, be like will shed light on CHP's plan that day. Dodging and dodging the gun shoots. Providing answers and accountability. And then I would hide. So other kids don't feel the need to plan for the next CHP shootout. Now, to be clear, the purpose of fighting for this video is not to air graphic or sensational images. It's to provide context and clarity and closure for a traumatized community. And the purpose of this lawsuit is to prevent one agency from effectively rewriting state law. Well, I think after you watch this clip, you'll agree that, you know, this judge's tongue lashing is, you know, that's maybe even far greater punishment to this old corrupt police chief than, you know, perhaps the community service that he got and the pay and restitution and, you know, just a typical shame. This judge did a good job and it was an appropriate sentence and the tongue lashing was just mwah. False impression about uh, the impression that you've made on me. This isn't just reckless on your part. I don't believe that for one minute. Not for one second do I believe that you're just a poor bookkeeper. We're talking about a factor of over 10. You, you paid 1,000 when you were supposed to pay 12,000. You paid 3,000 when you were supposed to pay 49,000. That's not an oops. That's not a, I, I just am a sloppy bookkeeper. That's a person who essentially was and maybe Ms. Ms. Uh, Hibbert is right when she said that says that you did good things with some of that money, but you were essentially robbing from Peter to pay Paul. And and I I don't buy the argument that it was just an oversight. And as soon as it was brought to your attention, you said, "Oh my gosh, let me correct this." Um, I believe you believe that you could just do this, get away with it, nobody would notice. Um, but for the phenomenal investigative work done by the agents um, who testified in this case, I think he never would have paid this money. Um, so I don't buy that argument. I don't buy the sloppy bookkeeper argument. Um, it just, it doesn't fly. I, I've listened to the testimony. Sometimes when cases aren't tried, as judges, it becomes difficult to assess what really happened because you, you don't get to really hear uh, the facts of the case um, as much as you do when there's a trial. But here, it, it was abundantly clear that you were you just were kind of running a scam. I mean, we're not going to get too deep into it because a lot of the counts were dismissed against you. But there was an awful lot of testimony that I heard uh, that, that signaled a, a guy who was willing to cut corners. Um, that's who you are. I mean, let's not kid ourselves, right? This is your third time in the courtroom. Or is it fourth? Third or fourth time? Third, Your Honor. All right, so we, we have two separate instances where you've been charged with this sort of behavior, right? The first time it happens, you might say, oh my gosh, whew, 
Here I am, a police officer. I've been charged in Portage County for misconduct revolving around um, a cigar shop I own. You might say, well, you know, I'm a fine police officer, but I'm a bad cigar shop owner, operator. Um, I've got to do better. Then you get another case and you say, oh my God, I can't believe this happened again. I I I've got to do better. Now a third time and we're supposed to write that off as just another oops. That's, that's nonsense. I don't buy it, not for one minute. That's not to suggest that Ms. Hibbert is wrong when she says that there's good in you. I'm certain that it's true. Um, but, but you were stealing. To come in here and say something else um, is somewhat offensive. Um, in the end, though, what you pled guilty to was a single fourth degree felony with a presumption in favor of community control. And as judges, we're not just throwing darts at a spinning board and hoping that we hit the right sentence. We use the guidance that we're given. And this is a nonviolent offense. You have no felony criminal history. So this is your first felony conviction. Um, I don't see that as a small matter. Um, I see particularly someone who's spent their career in law enforcement uh, having to carry around uh, a felony conviction as a significant thing. Um, so although I'm, I'm in no way fooled by your story of the hapless business owner who just can't shoot straight, I'm not gonna overreact um, and incarcerate you today. Uh, I don't believe that police officers, um, when they commit crimes that are really unrelated to their business, ought to be treated more harshly than say a, a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. You know, the fact of the matter is, um, I, I'm going to sentence you like I would anyone else charged with a low level, nonviolent felony of the fourth degree who has no prior felony criminal history. So although I certainly appreciate why the government might be inclined to ask for prison here, I think it would be an overreaction. I think it's unfair to people who have committed their lives to law enforcement, which is a real honor to be able to say that my job is to protect and serve the community. Um, I mean, that's a real honor, but I don't think that the payback for having committed yourself to a life in law enforcement is for judges to immediately send you to prison and apply some sort of police officer specification. That means whenever a police officer commits a crime, they have to go to prison when another person wouldn't. I don't think that's appropriate. Um, so I'm not going to incarcerate you even in the face of your foolish explanation as to why you did this. You need to take some time while you're on probation um, and, and, and do some soul searching and figure out what your life plan is going to be. Because cutting corners and running raggedy businesses where you steal from the state hasn't worked for you. You're now a convicted felon. Here's where it gets a little bit more interesting. Now that you are a convicted felon, and you're about to be on probation to me for the next five years. If I even get a whiff, a sniff, that you're cutting corners out there in the world, that you're running some kind of a business and maybe not doing the things that you're supposed to do, that maybe you've put a business in someone else's name and you're teaching them, them how to cut these corners, if I find out about it, you're going to prison. Do you understand me? Yes, Your Honor. Is there anything unclear about that? No, Your Honor. You're going to have to pay this restitution. You will be responsible for, what is it, $149,000? $149,954.50. Um, that restitution will be a condition of your community control. If I sent you to prison, it would make it more difficult for you to repay that debt. Um, so that's one of the other benefits of you being able to be in the community. And in addition to that, um, you know, it's also not lost on me that, that you tarnish the badge when you do this. Now you didn't do it relative to your work as a police officer, right? This wasn't something that 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 you used your role as a police officer um, to sort of get away with the crime. Um, but look, let's let's be clear. The reason why all these cameras are pointed at you is because you're a police officer, not just a police officer, but chief of police who has fallen this far. It stains the badge. It blemishes the badge. You're going, you're going to have a consequence that's tangible, not just the intangible um, consequence of a felony conviction. Um, you're going to give back to the community. 
Um, this went on for many years. Um, going back to 2014, uh, our window is a, is a six year window. Um, so with that in mind, you're going to do 600 hours of community service. 100 hours for every year that you engaged in this scam. And that's what it was, it was a scam. I don't, again, I don't be repetitive, but the sloppy bookkeeper story is not believable for a guy that's been in court on two separate occasions for similar conduct. So for each year you engaged in, in this um, scam, you'll do 100 hours of community service. Uh, I would certainly, um, I, I would never over any point in that five years you're on probation to me, I'd never forget that I, I, I'm giving you a chance, that your judge gave you a chance, right? But that's all it is. If it turns out that Ms. Soul and, and the state of Ohio is right, and you just don't have it in you to do good, then you'll make a mistake over these five years, and you'll end up going to prison. On the other hand, I hope that just like me, uh, on some level, the state of Ohio is rooting for you to do well, right? The goal of this is to see people not recidivize. The goal of this is to correct behavior. And there ought to be punishment. The punishment is the $600 of community service. But, but the hope is that over the course of the next five years, um, you, even if it's only out of fear, um, the state of Ohio won't have to worry about you stealing from the state anymore uh, because of that, that heightened anxiety that your, your freedom is at stake. Do you understand? Yes, sir. Uh, normally, it's the course inclination um, to, to create incentives uh, for people to do well on community control. Uh, and so I, I always look for ways to consider terminating community control early. So I would commonly put people on maybe five years of community control, but I'll say, look, if you can show me a year of sobriety, um, 12 straight months, we'll terminate your probation. But I want you to understand, I'm not going to do that in this case. I want there to be some certainty that you're being supervised for as long a period of time as I possibly can. So that's the, that's the uh, maybe the one dissimilarity to the way I'm treating you and I might someone else. Uh, I want you to be supervised for as long as the law allows me to do it. And that's the five years. Uh, so while you're on uh, community control, you'll report monthly, uh, you'll be drug tested, um, you will have to maintain verifiable employment. Uh, you, are, uh, you are on a habitual offenders list, so you can't um, operate a business in the state of Ohio. You'll have to have some sort of verifiable employment. Um, I'll, I'll give you some flexibility there because I understand that you are retired, but, but there's gonna have to be some work. Uh, you'll have to show that you're doing some work in addition to just the community service. Um, as I indicated, you will be drug tested. Um, I don't know if there's a drug issue here. Maybe there's not. Um, None whatsoever, Your Honor. That's, that's fine. I'm happy to hear that. Um, but, but on the off chance that there should come a time uh, where you test positive for a, a, an illegal substance, I want you to understand I'm not going to incarcerate you for that. Uh, we'll just, we'll talk more and we'll figure out a way to help you if there is a drug issue that, that, uh, that, that should arise. Um, and to that, uh, to that end, I want you to be forthcoming with our probation department. If there are issues that you have that maybe haven't been addressed in open court, uh, maybe they're too private uh, to discuss in open court, discuss them with your probation officer. Develop a relationship with the probation officer so that you can speak with that person. We have a fantastic probation department. Uh, bless you. Um, I, I, I certainly hope that you're able to pay this money back. Um, I don't want you to think that just because, um, maybe on some level, um, I've had some harsh words for you, Mr. Gardner, um, that, that I want to see you do poorly. Uh, to the contrary, my hope is that this sentence uh, will have the net effect of you doing well and extricating yourself from the system and never having to, uh, to, to go through this again. Do you understand? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Ms. Sowell, anything else on behalf of the state? No, Your Honor, we would just ask the journal entry to reflect the restitution amount. It will be in the journal entry. Thank you. Ms. Everett? 
Nothing. Thank you, Your Honor. Very turn.